today our year's journey has brought us to Maleg on the west coast of Scotland. And here I am waiting my turn to go on the car ferry, which will take me over the sea to Skye and on the first part of my journey to the Isles of Harris and Lewis. On some boats, your car has to be swung on board by a crane, but this is a modern ferry. I can drive straight onto the ship's lift. And after the crossing, I can drive off again at Armadale on the island of Skye. I expect you know the famous song about the Isle of Skye and Bonnie Prince Charlie. This is a beautiful island. I wish we had time to explore it properly, but I have to get to Uig to catch the next car ferry for the much longer voyage over to the Isles of Harris and Lewis, which are really one single island. The central part of Lewis lies under a blanket of black moorland, peat bogs and lochs. Nobody lives here permanently, but very little will grow in these wild surroundings. Hardly any heather, but sedges and poor grasses provide some food for the Lewis black-faced sheep. <laughs> Once, perhaps 900 to 1,000 years ago, the land was covered in trees, and their roots can sometimes be found in the peat. It is, of course, the rocks below, which give the island's countryside its special character. These are the oldest rocks in Britain, and during the Ice Age, huge glaciers pushed over them, grinding away their surface and leaving behind in places a layer of clay. On this better soil, you find small farms or crops. I'm driving across the empty Black Moor of Lewis, from Stornoway towards the northwest. But most of the townships lie on a mile-wide strip bordering the coast. I'm on my way to the township of Barvis, and after that, to Brew. Brew is a small place with long and narrow crofts, each surrounded by a wall, and each with its own family house. The croft belonging to John Patterson is about seven acres, and it stretches from the house down to the loch. The soil, which varies from nine inches to three feet in depth, lies on top of boulder clay and rock. And John Patterson is ploughing furrows for the potatoes which are usually sown in May. Before they are planted, the seed potatoes are cut in two. Mrs. Patterson is planting the halves along the furrows. On the next run, the ploughshares cover them. And in August, the potato crop will be ready for harvesting. The Pattersons have an Ayrshire cow. She's won championships at Stornoway and Barber's shows. The calf's father was a beef shorthorn. The calf itself is only five months old, and when he's between 50 months and two years old, he'll go for beef. The house is a sturdy one. It has to be to stand up to the winter gales on this bleak island. You may be surprised to learn that John Patterson built it very largely himself. It's cosy in here with the peat fire. The people who live on the island of Lewis depend very much on peat for heating their homes. And in Mrs. Patterson's kitchen, this modern-looking stove also burns peat as its fuel.
Now, where do you suppose the peat comes from? Not in sacks from the coal merchant. The Pattersons have to cut it from the moor themselves. This peat cutting takes place in spring and summer. The top coarse layers of turf are cut away first. Underneath the turf, but above the boulder clay, lies the best smooth-grained waterlogged layer of peat. This is cut out in wet slabs by a special cutting tool called an iron. Just watch and see how efficient it is. The slabs of wet peat are allowed to dry for several months before being used. The work, of course, is hard and takes a long time. But the islanders need the peat for fuel and they enjoy the cutting as a social occasion as well. The cutting of peat over many centuries has laid bare the boulder clay, which is called skinned ground. The township also has some 5,000 acres of common grazing on the moor. All the crofters in the township have the right to put their animals on it at any time. The Lewis men have been reclaiming some of their moorland to increase their grazing. This is some of the moorland belonging to the parish of Stornoway, not at present much use to anyone. But this machine is spreading 10 tonnes of shell sand on each acre of the moor. The sand lightens the heavy peat, and it will be followed by 500 weights of phosphates and 300 weights of mixed fertilisers. On top of this, clover and grass seed will be sown in early summer. By next August, the grass will be established and some three or four sheep can be put on to graze each acre of the reseeded area. Here on the right is bare moorland. But on the other side of the road is fine grazing for cattle and sheep. All of it reclaimed moor. Now a crofter spends only 10% of his time on his croft. The rest is spent weaving Harris tweed. The pure wool, which must have been produced in Scotland, is unloaded in Stornoway in enormous bales brought from the mainland. The island tweed industry uses up one third of the wool clipped from Scottish sheep. The wool is then taken to several mills in Stornoway where it's spun and dyed. The strands of yarn are brought together into long lengths in the mills. Wool from a number of different bobbins is unwound at the same time and gathered by hand into thicker strands. This is a complicated and delicate operation. You can see how the length of yarn is wound evenly round the wooden pegs. This length of yarn is now 36 and a half yards long. But these are not our yards, they're weaver's yards, each one of which is seven feet in length, not three. I know I'd get into a terrible mess if I tried this. And I find it surprising how this great length goes into a sack too. The yarn is then sent by road to the hundreds of crofter weavers all over the Isle of Lewis.
the sacks are put on the roadside by each house. John Patterson's loom shed for the weaving is across the road from his house. Mr. and Mrs. Patterson are getting ready to start a new piece of tweed. And to qualify for the orb trademark, the tweed must have been woven in a crofter's home in the Outer Isles. The first process is beaming the warp. And this means pulling the yarn out into a long length over wooden rollers set in the ceiling of the loom shed. eventually be wound up onto a big bobbin. A wooden bar has been slipped through the loops at the end of the yard. The strands of wool, in bunches of twelve, are now grouped between the metal nails on the wooden cross piece. When this is completed, Mrs. Patterson then begins to wind the yarn onto the big bobbin for the loop. and now the winding really becomes a man's task. When the bobbin is full, it's carried over to be fixed to the loom. As the loom is worked, the bobbin will pay out its length of wool. There are in fact some 648 ends of wool, and these have to be tied by hand to the ends of the previous length of tweed. These lengthwise threads are known as the warp threads. During weaving, alternate warp threads are held up and down on the loom while a shuttle carrying the weft threads is shot backwards and forwards across them. The shuttles are loaded with full bobbins of wool and these Mrs. Patterson winds on an electrically operated bobbin winder. In the meantime, John Patterson has finished tying the ends and can remove the bars. The previous length of tweed is then pulled through until it catches onto specially sharpened points on the roller. The loom is operated by foot power applied to treadles. and the new tweed begins to take shape. The wooden metal tip shuttle 
is being reloaded with one of the full bobbins from the winding machine. This is then put into the box at the end, from which it will be thrown backwards and forwards, weaving its way through the rising and falling threads of the warp. It's remarkable how these simple up and down movements of the feet can be converted into so many complicated actions, isn't it? Besides having a loom for weaving Harry's tweed, John Patterson also has a spinning wheel more than a hundred years old. This is a special demonstration for our benefit, but nowadays, as we've seen, the wool that Mr. Patterson uses for his loom is spun at the mills in Stornoway. There can't be many places in Great Britain where you can see this happening. But now, let's go back to the Harris Tweed again. The finished tweed now coming out is some 80 yards long and 28 and a half inches wide. It'll be collected and paid for by the mill in Stornoway, where it'll also be cleaned and inspected. At the mill, the finished rolls of tweed finally appear having earned their orb mark, so well known outside the Isles of Lewis and Harris. In this mill, more than 15,000 different patterns of tweed are known. The tweeds are packed in bales for dispatch to many places abroad. The United States. And to which country is this one going? Woolen materials from the Outer Isles are famous all over the world, of course, but there are plenty of other places with their own particular weaves. This is a rug woven at Morra, on the west coast of the mainland of Scotland. And this jacket that I'm wearing, that's made of Donegal tweed. Do you know where Donegal is? Where is your nearest woolen industry, I wonder? And what kinds of sheep supply the wool? Are they sheep like these? If there's a tailor shop or a big drapery stores near you, you might care to find out what kind of woolen materials they sell. And of course, there are lots of other kinds of woven materials besides woolen ones. And I'm quite sure that the story of some of those is going to be very different from the story of that of the Outer Isles. Goodbye. <laughs>